provide some uh, local character to their neighborhoods. Uh, this policy uh, has not yet been, been utilized. We haven't had any requests for that, but I think that there have been some, some requests to paint streets other than residential neighborhood streets. And uh, I know that Mayor Wagner has had some discussions with people regarding that and uh, Right now, the policy doesn't allow for, a, for painting of arterials or major or minor thoroughfares or streets that are outside of uh, predominantly neighbor, residential neighborhood areas. So I guess the question is, is the policy going to be altered for that purpose or if there are any other questions regarding that policy? So as the policy currently stands, it only applies to residential streets, Correct. intersections, and no words, recognizable symbols, logos, or advertisements. That's, that's correct. That's correct. It's intended to be uh, local art, so to speak, and not to be advertisement or um, in support of or in non-support of any particular issue or anything like that. Mr. Mayor, would you like to speak on this? Uh, ooh, wow, this is loud. Um, yeah, the, just a little bit of history behind it. This is a, basically an idea that I got on a, um, uh, at a conference out uh, in Portland, Oregon. Um, they, had, uh, they had enacted a policy like this that allowed neighborhoods to um, paint intersections or to do other improvements to intersections like little free libraries, uh, little coffee kiosks, um, decorating bus stops, that kind of thing. And uh, when I was out there at the time, they had something like 45 intersections that had been, had been decorated or otherwise improved. I mean, to the point that they, they actually had tour buses that would, you could take tours <laughs> of the painted intersections. And the impetus for them doing it was a guy who was an architect who did a lot of work in uh, South and Central America and really was impressed by how a lot of cities in those areas are built around a town square and that the town square becomes the center of activity in those small towns. And he was trying to figure out a way to bring that sort of um, activity to his neighborhood and because of the way suburban America is built, there it's not built around town squares, and really the only sort of town square you could you could create would be an intersection. So um, he did a little guerrilla urbanism. Uh, he and his friends by painting an intersection, um, even though the city of Portland had told him that he couldn't do it, <laughs> and so uh, they went and did it anyway. And then um, the uh, and Mark, I have to trash your transportation guys here, but the transportation guys freaked out and told them they had to paint over it and they had to sandblast it and get rid of it and all this stuff. And then some of the politicians out there saw it and really liked it. So they created this policy to allow for it. And then what they discovered was in the areas where they had these painted intersections, there actually was a drop in crime. Um, there was a, a big boost in um, community involvement because they set it up because in a way that um, each year it had to be maintained. So what they discovered was in these neighborhoods that did them, they would get together and have a party every year and they would repaint the intersection. And so it, it stimulated community involvement. It was public art. It was, um, uh, and they actually saw property values go up because 
when something in the neighborhood like that happened that was beautiful, it made other people want to fix their houses up, um, do different things in their, in, around the neighborhood to fix the neighborhood up. And so, you know, I thought that this was a very cheap, uh, in fact, free to the city of High Point way of, of promoting public art and bringing, um, uh, bringing communities together. And I've been hoping that someone would do one <laughs> since we enacted the policy, I, I've pushed a lot of groups um, and folks to try to, uh, you know, identify an intersection and go ahead and paint one uh, as a demonstration, and maybe other people would, might like to copy it, but that hasn't happened yet. Um, but the reason for the, the, when I talked to the folks in Portland, they said one of the key things for them was that the artwork, um, in order to get around constitutional questions of um, of speech, uh, they don't allow, they didn't allow any words, they didn't allow any recognizable symbols, you know, so like you couldn't go out and get a corporate sponsor to pay for the paint and put Sherwin Williams down in the corner, you know, or so, you know, in exchange for advertising. So they didn't, they didn't allow that. Um, and that was mainly just to get around political statements, to get around issues of constitutionality and free speech. Uh, to say this, this is our work, it's, it's not going to promote any sort of um, political agenda or, or anything. So that was their, one of their biggest rules was you, you, you can't allow any words. Um, you can make statements through art without words. I mean, everybody kind of understands that. But, um, but at the same time, uh, that, that helped to prevent the city from being put in a position where they had to make choices of what speech they were going to allow and what speech they were not, which is unconstitutional. So, um, but I think when we set up the policy, we set it up for uh, intersections, cul-de-sacs, mm -hmm. um, in, in residential areas, right? Um, because, and that was more of a safety issue. Mark, if correct me if I'm wrong, you were, I know you were concerned about, um, you know, more prominent streets and what it. The confusion it might cause to drivers, and maybe you might want to speak to that. I don't, I don't know. Yes, yeah, so you know, most residential streets have very limited pavement markings that are used for traffic control. The very few lane lines, arrows, stop bars, whatever the case may be. So there'd be very little conflict with those markings. If you were to, if you were to go to a major intersection or even a, a, a minor intersection that carries a fair amount of volume, uh, there would be con some conflict with those markings and could cause driver confusion and uh, just not be conforming with our typical uh, methods of controlling traffic through intersections. So that was the concern there. You wouldn't have that situation arise uh, to any great significance in most of our residential neighborhoods. Thank you all. I, I, I need to add one addition here. Michael Holmes is now has now joined us. Is that correct, Councilman Holmes? That is correct. Uh, also, I believe Britt Moore is with us today. Is that, are you with us, Britt? I am. Any other council members remote now? Councilman Johnson. Councilman Tyrone Johnson is with us as well. If there are no others, um, I'll, I will pass the floor to Councilman Jefferson. You're the one you, you had asked us to put on our agenda. So the floor is yours, sir. Absolutely. So uh, Mark, thank you so much for the information that you brought today. And Mayor Wagner, thank you for uh, the leadership that you've shown on bringing this, um, this new possibility and opportunity to High Point. I think that, uh, I think that it's got all types of potential. Um, when I made the motion or the request that this be added to today's agenda, it was in regards to a number of inquiries, requests, um, and altogether uh, statements of sentiment um, made by residents about us potentially taking this item um, and doing it maybe a little differently than what we've done already. Um, and to that point, Mayor Wagner, I don't know if you've received the actual formal request Request. I do know I got a call from Ms. Phyllis Bridges who said that she'd been in communication with you and perhaps you have that formal request for us all to
to consider for us all to look at. I do believe that you and I spoke about it and that number of, uh, I guess, the details within her requests are a little outside um, the scope and parameters of what we allow within our own policy. To that point, um, there, there's, there's a couple of questions and I do think more information is needed um, to the concern in regards to placing these kinds of murals or paintings on commercial streets. Um, do you mind sharing with us some of the data to substantiate that concern as far as if there's other municipalities where they allow it, you know, has there been an increase in wrecks at that stop compared to prior to having the painting? Um, I'm sorry, Madam Attorney, it looks like you were about to say something. Joanne Carlisle, City Attorney, and I'm glad to weigh in on that. Um, in the past year, actually, the environment has begun to change from the federal government. They've really started clumping down on intersections that are painted, bike lanes, anything it appears to me from the articles that I've read um, having to do with any markings on the street for safety purposes. And right now, that is, it's not settled. I mean, there's arguments to be made that it slows traffic down where it needs to slow traffic down in a safe way and the federal government is not necessarily agreeing with that. Um, so the, they, the environment has changed quite a bit since 2016 when we really did a lot of research, thoroughly investigated this issue. We've got a couple different things too here. You're talking about the painting policy that we have in place right now that deals with the residential and the individuals, not the city actually doing the painting. And you've got also something that's called government speech which is what came into play when we enacted our policy in 2016. Um, and, you know, obviously, again, the environment's changed. You know that some of the other cities, including some of our sister cities, did some painting, et cetera. And I don't know if you're aware or not, but they've paused their programs because kind of cart before the horse thing to try to get things in place so that they could manage it correctly and not be challenged. Also, what I'd also ask is given go off. Sorry, I think my mic went off. Um, also, given any of the formal requests that we have received, um, have we considered any mutually viable alternatives um, to what that formal request might have been? Mayor Wagner? Yeah, I can I can give you an update on that. I, I met with Phillips Bridges earlier in the summer. Um, she, she had sent me an email and asked about the possibility of, of painting a mural uh, on Hamilton Street in front of City Hall. Um, I think she wanted to say in racism now. Um, she came in and I, well, actually when she sent me the first email, I, um, I responded back to her and I explained to her about the policy that we had for uh, painting intersections. And, you know, I encouraged her at the time to, um, to try to operate under the policy that we had. And, um, you know, and I, I, then I offered to meet with her and she came and we met in my office. And um, I don't remember on that day whether she had an actual rendering of, I think she did have an actual, uh, just a mock-up of what it might look like. And my, my recollection was that she was gonna, she wanted to pay it in racism now. And then within the wording, it was gonna have, it wasn't just gonna be block letters of, of a single color, but it was gonna be, Within the wording, I think it was going to have children um, kind of making up the words, so to speak. So um, we talked about that. I, I encouraged her to, to operate on the policy that we had. And I, actually, I, I even volunteered to help pay for the paint um, <laughs> out of my own pocket, which because I, I really want somebody to do some artwork um, in one of these intersections. But um, at the time, she was, you know, very intent on, on just painting that on, on Hamilton Street. Um, I think she felt like it would make a statement during market and that it would be a, a public statement that um, people would support. And so um, I explained to her at, at the time also my, my reservations from a constitutional standpoint about um, the city, you know, painting uh, political language on, on a street and, and what sort of um, kind of can of worms that might open up uh, because groups that maybe we don't agree with would come in and want to paint things on streets that 
that we don't agree with. And it would limit our ability if we start allowing people to, my worry was if we start allow, allowing people to paint uh, political language on, on streets, then we open ourselves up for a lot of political language that maybe the community doesn't agree with and or the majority of the community doesn't agree with. And my worry was putting the city in a, in a situation where we, we have to be the one to pick and choose um, and what kind of constitutional threat that might be from a legal standpoint for the city. So and that's it, being able to set up a process that you would be able to withstand a challenge is gonna be a difficult thing to do. Not that it's not impossible, but it's gonna be a very difficult thing for you to do because we're not only gonna to have to amend that policy because it only applies to residential. This is going to, like I said earlier, going to be some speech that you have to adopt as something that you feel that the city wants to say. It has to be so neutral that, and you have to go through a process basically to allow people to be heard. Um, there has to be then a determination as to, you know, whether or not it's allowed. Um, it takes a lot of time. You actually have to even bid out for the artist. Um, I don't know about Hamilton, and that would be Mar Mark's area, but I would presume too, if it's a state street, you have to get some permission from the state. I don't know the answer to that. Yes, we would if it's a state road. Hamilton is not a state road. It's a city owned and maintained street. But if it were a state road, we would have to get approval from the Department of Transportation and most likely get an encroachment agreement for that. And I'm sure that there would be uh, a list of restrictions placed on that by the state. And I don't know what they would be, but I'm sure that there would be conditions to that. One, one of the things I did mention to Phyllis during our meeting was that it, I wouldn't necessarily have a problem with looking at expanding our policy to allow painting of more than just residential intersections. You know, if we could find a, an intersection that's in, you know, a higher profile sort of area that's, you know, a commercial street, but it's not a state maintained road, something like that, um, where, where you were painting within the box of an intersection, um, or, you know, in Chapel Hill, they have allowed people, they've allowed artists to come in and paint uh, crosswalks uh, with art because it, it actually increases the visibility of the crosswalk and, and makes it safer for pedestrians crossing, so. And Mayor, <coughs> excuse me, that is the exact argument that the feds have raised since the end of 20. Oh, as to whether it does? Ex exactly. Yeah. It is that square and it is the crosswalks. Yeah. Um, they even have, I was amazed, but it doesn't take much when it comes to art, I guess, they have a 3D um, artwork that makes it look like there's a child standing in the street to slow traffic. Um, oh, wow. Really <laughs> impressive. I don't know how they do that. Well, that's fine until somebody slams on the brakes and the people exactly. behind them hit them, you know. <laughs> exactly. So. But, but that was one of the traffic calming devices that someone had painted that the feds said, no, this is not acceptable, where clearly it was slowing traffic down and it seemed like the citizens of that community were happy with it. <clears throat> yeah. But then, you know, we've got the federal government that has some dollars attached to some of this, the yeah. streets and paving as well. So, you know, long story short, I, I wouldn't mind us maybe tweaking the policy to allow some artwork in, in places that are, that are more high profile. The, the, the issue really is, is painting words. And, and whether we're going to be the arbiter of that and, and what sort of legal um, exposure we have and really whether we want the nine of us sitting up there and being a jury on somebody's speech and whether, you know, whether we're going to allow it. It's not, it's not this certain message. It's, it's opening that box um, and I, you know, I, I don't know that we want to spend time. I, I mean, I don't know what the response would be. I don't know if we'd have no groups come in and ask or, which, or if we'd have 15, you know, but I, I, I would worry about us getting, potentially getting bogged down in, in a lot of, you know, reviewing art. <laughs> no, I totally, uh, I totally agree with that, um, Mayor. And then also- hey, this, is, this is Wesley, this is the chair speaking. Can you announce your name before you start talking? Each time we've gotten, we, we need to let the public know who we are speaking. Thank you. This is Monica Peters. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Wagner. And I'm so glad that you had brought that street art to the attention in 2016, because it is really cool. So in our retreat back in February, we had talked about wanting to create more diversity in, in High Point. So what if at that corner on Hamilton and the Transportation Center, if we did crosswalks, 
and the art express diversity. No words, but it's an expression of diversity in art. Yeah, I, I, this is uh, Councilman Jefferson. I think to that point, um, whether it's the idea that Councilwoman Peters has, or it's the idea that Mayor Wagner has, I think that we should be able to consider what some mutually viable alternative options are. Um, I'd also like to uh, gauge what some of the response is, maybe to a Ms. Bridges and others who have brought this to our attention. Um, you, you said that you brought it up to her um, and you shared it with her. What, what, did she have a response, Mayor Wagner? When I brought up what, I'm a little confused about what you're asking. You said she reached out in regards to the mural and that you emailed her back saying what was within our policy and that you encouraged her yeah. to have an idea within that. She sort of has, um, she submitted the, the idea for painting the words on the street. And I actually encouraged her to talk to Mark as well. And I think she did reach out and, and talk to you. She, she asked if Hamilton was a state street. That was yeah. pretty much the extent of our- Yeah, that's discussion. right. That's what, I, that's what I asked her to do, to contact UNC. Cause I didn't know at the time whether it was a state road or not. Right. So um, we've gone back and forth. I think she is still um, interested in the idea of painting Hamilton street. Uh, and, the, and still interested in the idea that we might be willing to amend our policy to do that. Um, I've explained to her my reservations for it. I'm, I'm, I'm not against the idea of, you know, what she wants to paint. I just, I'm, I'm very concerned about the door, the box that we're opening up. Absolutely. And, and from a constitutional standpoint, as much as anything. Um, and so it kind of, um, I don't know that we reach an impasse, so to speak, because I think we both have the same goal of, of I think she and I agree on a lot of things. We'd love to see more public art in the, in the city. And, Absolutely. and um, you know, the idea of, of painting some intersections is, it, I think is a really cool idea. And I think she agrees with that. Um, but I think we've, we've reached the point where, um, you know, the question is gonna come before council of whether we want to amend our policy to allow what she's asking for or not. And so yeah. that's kind of where we are. I love it, and this is Councilman Jefferson again, I love it if uh, <clears throat> perhaps we don't make a decision on this today. I, I don't think we're ready. I think that there's a number of things that we still need to gather and a number of conversations that still need to be had. I think um, one, one item of interest uh, is that Madam Attorney mentioned that the federal government is looking at this item and the issue of language at major intersections and art at major intersections, I think, it, I think as is actually the words and how that impacts traffic. Um, and so maybe we get some more information on um, where that, where they stand on that, where if they're uh, corroborating and pulling together data, um, if we could get our hands on that. Uh, I agree with Mayor Wagner that it, it, it is a decision to make. Um, and to the question of, do we want to make the decision a ton of times for art? I think that as stewards of the public's trust and representatives of the great um, city of High Point and 120,000 residents here, and when a number of them reach out about something that they think is important, um, I, I mean, I think it's worth our deliberation. So I, I, I would entertain, and, and I don't think a motion needs to be made for it, but obviously I don't think we're ready to make a decision today and that more information needs to be gathered. Chairman. Okay, Chairman Hudson, any, any further discussion on this? If not, thank you very much, thank Mr. McDonald, Mr. Mayor. We'll move on to our next agenda item, which was brought to us by Councilwoman Peters, and this is a welcome sign that we're hoping to install on South Main Street. Would you like to take it or staff? The staff, this is Monica Peters. Does staff have anything prepared on this welcome sign? We do. Okay. Um, we, uh, I think Tim McKinney is on uh, the call. Uh, I've asked Tim to take a look at two of our existing uh, welcome signs and kind of give us a ballpark estimate. And uh, I'll ask Tim to correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, one is more of stone and then one up on 70, uh, um, I-74 north of, of the city is brick. Um, looking at both signs um, uh, along with lighting, lettering, uh, and the structure itself, 
we're looking at somewhere in about the fifteen thousand dollar range to um, to build a, a, a new sign. Uh, I've asked Mark to look at a couple sites on South Main Street um, down near the intersection. Do you have those um, aerials, uh, Mark? Both of these sites are owned by uh, DOT, and we would have to get their approval uh, with an encroachment agreement, I'm sure, uh, and a, uh, it includes future maintenance, et cetera, uh, for these sites. So um, I'll let Mark uh, talk about the two specific sites and then uh, whatever further discussion the committee wants to have, uh, we'll be glad to join in. And again, this is Councilman Hudson. I'll request that you say your name before you speak. Okay. Um, both, of, both of the locations are on state-owned property down at the intersection of South Main Street and Archdale Road. Uh, this is apparently residual right-of-way that was uh, acquired by the state when there were intersection improvements made there many years ago. Uh, I, I couldn't tell you how long ago it was, but there were improvements made there to add some additional lanes on Archdale Road at, at this traffic signal there. Uh, this first picture is taken from a driveway coming out of the back of the shopping center where the old Kmart used to be onto Archdale Road. And then what that red line depicts on that particular corner is a minimum sight line for traffic coming out of that of that driveway. We wouldn't want anything to be out further than that, closer to the road than that red line, just to make sure that people that may be coming out of the back of that driveway, and there may not be that many now, but just to make sure that they could see traffic coming around the corner right there. Um, we're not in, pictures are not in order, but um, I'll get to the next one here. This is an aerial view of that same red line from the that goes basically from that driveway over towards South Main Street. The yellow line is the DOT right of way line. So that whole grassy area right there on, on that northwest corner there is all DOT right of way. And my recommendation is if you if that particular location was chosen would be to, to locate the sign at least 10 to 15 feet further back from where that red line would be. And you can see that green block there would be more or less where that would be. Um, if you were looking at that from, from the road, if you were going northbound from Archdale into High Point, you've just crossed, at this point, you've just crossed into High Point from Archdale and it would be over to the left and that's where the green block would be there. So the sign would be roughly in that general location. Across the street on the opposite corner, there's another piece of uh, residual property. And that's this sort of this wedge between the two roads. And uh, right now that area is landscaped um, with some trees and low shrubbery right next to the gas station that's also there in that wedge. And that green box there depicts an approximate location in that area. We don't have any real site issues there except to ensure that we don't set it so far out to the road that it might restrict uh, the view of traffic for people that are exiting that driveway from the, from the gas station. <laughs> And that's what it would look like from the from the road. So this is just a little bit before you get to the first one that I showed. So it would be over in that uh, in that wedge area uh, between Archdale Road and South Main Street. Both of those areas are state right of way. Uh, we would need to talk with the Division Seven engineer about about uh, the possibility of constructing something within that right of way. 
and obtain all the proper encroachment agreements that would be necessary for that. Um, there's certainly other things that might need to be considered. We don't know what utilities are in that area, what might be buried in that area that we'd be that would factor into the exact placement of it. But uh, the first step would be to uh, to make contact and have a discussion with uh, the Division Seven engineer and see if that's possible at all. They they may just say no, we don't we don't want that, but but. Uh, it's a large enough area where I think it could support it. And just for some background, I don't know if you were there, Mark, but uh, I can't remember if it was December or January. Now that COVID's been here, you can't tell what month or year it is. But <laughs> I had a meeting with a, a bunch of business owners down the South Main area because there's been a lot of current concerns. We all know that. Um, but anyway, one of the complaints a lot of them had was that they don't really feel like they're part of High Point. And so uh, Rick Williams, who owns High Point uh, Furniture City Club, recommended, you know, a welcome to High Point. And he recommended that first location because it is such a perfect angle. And right now it's such an eyesore because it's just basically red mud. So, you know, he thought a welcome to High Point, sometimes just the smallest gesture like that can really change an attitude, attitude and show all the citizens in High Point that we care. And they're really, quite honestly, we look, I looked at it yesterday and there's really not a lot of other locations that offer the same opportunity as far as state right away. There could potentially be some private property that would be available, but there's no other state right of way that could support it along that part of the corridor. All right, Mr. Chairman Hudson again, thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. McDonald. And if there's no further discussion on that, I'll thank you. Thank you, Councilman <laughs> Peters, for this recommendation. I'll make a motion that we uh, uh, not approve because we don't have a motion <laughs> yet. But I make a I make a motion that we that we give staff a recommendation to pursue this and bring it before the full council. Second. There's a motion and a second on the floor. Is there any any discussion? Just clarification. Yes, sir. Uh, if you don't mind, we'd like to go ahead and approach NCDOT first and make sure that there's the possibility before we bring it to the council. I'll, okay. I'll, I will amend my motion to say I'll give you, I, I will give staff the, the ability to proceed as, they, as necessary. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So if there's no, if there's no other discussion, then uh, we'll take a vote on the motion. Uh, council, Councilman Holmes, how do you vote? Aye. Councilman Jefferson? Councilman Peters? Aye. And Councilman Hudson votes aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you all so much. Our next, our next discussion will be a uh, modif modification to our special events policy, and I will pass that out. Uh, I passed it out to Mr. Jefferson. A copy to Ms. Peters, and staff has this as well. Uh, this is simply a clarification of our co-sponsored events, the events that the city will co-sponsor. Uh, we have a, 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 fair, a fairly large list of, of uh, nonprofits that ask us to co-sponsor their events. And these events are, are events uh, such as 5Ks in the city. Uh, some, events, some events that we sponsor uh, currently are uh, Coltrane Festival, High Fest, the Uncle Sam Jam, uh, Go Far, uh, those types. And, and uh, I have passed out the policy to uh, the committee and I would like to read the last statement of the second paragraph of that policy, which says to maintain public trust procedures shall be established for the consistent, fair, and prompt evaluation of such requests. At that point in our policy, I would like to read some words that I'd like to add to our policy to clarify how we uh, establish co-sponsored events. Under categories of events, it will now read co-sponsored. Co-sponsored events are determined by the city council and our events of general interest to the public, which provide a special economic development benefit or advance the city's 
add the words livability or original words, public image. Add the sentence, the city will not, will not co-sponsor fundraising events for any organization. From that point on, everything is as written. And the reason that I would like to add that is we have a multitude of uh, nonprofits that request co-sponsorship of 5Ks, uh, which is the original purpose that we had this policy created is because we were spending in excess of $300,000 each year to put policemen on corners for these 5Ks. So rather than to have to pick and choose and give it, uh, give the option of counsel, uh, I, I would prefer that we make it policy so that it is across the board uh, and fair to everyone. So with that, I will make this motion to approve this amendment. Second. There's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion about this? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. This Councilman Jefferson, quick question. So in regards to not co-sponsoring any fundraising events, I, I guess just for clarity, that means any event that raises money for an organization in general, we would not co-sponsor. It would not be a part of our sponsored events. Um, so would, would that mean that events like the Coltrane Jazz Festival would fall underneath that? Because they're a nonprofit. That it would, it would not, it would not fall into that. It would not? It would not. And the purpose, the, the, the reason that I want to word that is, is if nonprofits are raising money that, that the uh, event should be paid for by the nonprofit themselves. There are exemptions like Coltrane and we can put exemptions in if you prefer. Okay, you know so it, it'll be a policy to not support fundraising events, except for the ones that we decide to support. Like ex exemptions, it sounds like. Correct, we can exempt. We can always exempt to that policy. <clears throat> I, I think I understand where we're going with this is that we're looking at events that have a really large impact as far as that economic development, livability, and so, so many of, of the other things. Um, I think that as is this amendment though, I'm, what I'm worried about, and maybe Madam Attorney can, can speak to it. it. Sounds like there's a little bit of ambiguity maybe in it. And, and the only reason why I say that is that at this point, you say uh, we're not co-sponsor any fundraising events for any organization. Um, I, think you're, I think you're labeling, this is Councilman Hudson. I think you're labeling Coltrane Festival as a, as a fundraiser. That, it doesn't mean they can't raise funds, but a fundraiser is to raise funds for another purpose. I mean, the Coltrane Festival is not a fundraising event. The funds that they raise maintain the event. Okay, I have a question and maybe a clarification. This is Councilwoman Peters. So, because I, at first I thought what, the way I read this is that if the organization is raising funds for themselves, then it can't be co-sponsored. But if, but if they're raising funds for others, okay. what about that? So that's, what, that's what fundraising is. That's, okay. the, that's the fundraising. Okay, so like in the case of the Bobby Labonte event, which of course now, I mean, unfortunately we've not been able to have any events, but um, yeah. so 2021, <laughs> hopefully that'll be the year, but you know, because they've raised funds for uh, like, I think they pick like five different nonprofits so would they be exempt under this? They wouldn't be exempt because that's what this list is of everyone else that asks money. Okay, yeah, maybe I'm not super clear on this. So, so the Labonte charity bike ride would be exempt even though it's for the purpose of fundraising. Oh, it would not, there, there are no exemptions to a policy. Policy is policy. So no, the, the Labonte ride would not be covered under this, but that falls under the same. Yeah, well, I think um, I that falls under the same as any other organization that raises money in order to give money to another organization. Well, and and charging admission to a to a festival is not fundraising. Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to rescind my 
um, my um, second, sorry, but I wasn't super clear, so. Well, Attorney Carlisle, um, let me just point out too that this is not definitive at this point in time. This is something that these questions that you're weighing right now will have to be weighed on a case-by-case -case basis when someone comes. It'll have to be, that determination will have to be made then because it says that city council deems in that category. So what exactly is the effect of this language then? Because if it's all gonna be weighed on a case by case basis, the language could be here and we could still very well carry on doing business as usual. I see the- I, and, 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 and I'm not trying to push back on anyone. I guess I'm just asking for clarification and to ensure that going forward, um, we remove as much gray so that, I mean, I, I can think of a number of events that even though they charge money for folks to attend, they're still fundraisers and that they're fundraising events for someone else or their fundraising events for themselves or their events that raise funds, even though they don't exactly come out way in the black or in the red, but they break even, they're still fundraising events. And so I, I, I guess for me, I just, I just feel like there's so much ambiguity around it that I'm not asking to shoot it down. I'm just asking for it to maybe be specified a little bit more and be very clear about why we're adopting this language to modify what our actual policy is. Well, Attorney Carlisle, again here, um, I wasn't in, involved in the drafting of it. From, from my perspective, my interpretation is to narrow down the categories and to make it a little bit more easier for council to make those decisions. But I'll look to, I don't know if Chairman has- Yes, that's, that's exactly what it, what it is. And it, it's the result of, you know, quite honestly, this year, uh, these discussions took three sessions, three meetings of the PL committee were devoted to co-sponsoring events. At the end of those three meetings, the recommendations that we made were unanimously approved by council. And then even after that, council added an event. So what, I, what I'm trying to do is to prevent spending months and months discussing city-sponsored events that the council will arbitrarily change later. Let's just stop anyway. putting them on the agenda. Well, let's just start stop putting them on the agenda. Well, we have to put them on the agenda. I know, but we've had lots and lots of meetings about events in a year that no events are taking place. And I think we should leave the policy as is written and and pray to God that October 2nd, something can change and that we can actually have events in 2021. But to, to specify that we will not co-sponsor fundraising events, it... There might be a lot of fundraising events that would love to host their event in High Point and choose not to based just solely on that. And those particular events could bring a lot of, you know, we also put a special economic development benefit that it could provide, public image that it could provide. So here we're almost cutting off where our goal is to even encourage the events to come to our city. So I'm, I'm not for changing this wording or adding this wording. This is Councilman Holmes. I, I, I think that there needs to be some retooling of, of, of this uh, amendment to this to this policy. Um, my biggest concern is if we're talking about that we're going to take this on a case by case basis, if there are going to be exemptions, um, what qualifies someone for an exemption? What's the process to receive an exemption? Um, is there a dollar threshold? Is there, it, it, it seems to be there's a lot of gray um, in, in how we interpret this policy change. Um, for me, a policy is uh, um, not, not necessarily rigid, but it's standardized so that um, everyone knows the interpretation of the policy. It's not left, it's not subjective. And I just, at this point, I feel like this adjustment leaves too much subjectivity uh, for it to be clear to anyone how to proceed. It's Chairman Hudson, thank you, Councilman Holmes. And I will say the reason that, that this was added is to make more clarity and more rigidity. And I will add um, one of the dangers of having everything be at our discretion is that public perception is when we give someone uh, 
uh, a co-sponsorship and someone else, a co uh, the, the, we deny another organization co-sponsorship, we are doing favors for friends. That's what this, that's what this addition is trying to eliminate. So if you have 30 groups that are trying to get co-sponsorship and you give two of those groups co-sponsorship, there better be a good reason why you didn't give the other 28 co-sponsorship. And that's, that's the danger that we're in when we just decide on our own. That's why we enact policy. So I would like to bring this back up at a later day and keep discussing it. So I will withdraw my motion. Um, there's nothing further on that. We'll move on to the next agenda item, which is the traffic bombing projects, which we have several of. And uh, we have Martin McDonald again presenting. Okay, thank you again. Uh, this next item is, uh, is an informational item for you, uh, just to keep you apprised of some of the efforts of our department uh, as we work towards providing uh, neighborhoods with traffic calming as those requests are made. Um, as you're aware, back in uh, late uh, 2016, council uh, adopted a policy for traffic calming, it was an update to, a, to an original policy that was developed probably 20 plus years ago. Um, since that time, we went for quite a spell where we, we did not get a lot of requests, but now we are, they're starting to, at first they started to trickle in and now they're starting to, to sort of flood in and we are processing those as, as we can. We um, we've had, have a budget a line item in our departmental budget for installing traffic calming uh, devices in neighborhoods that are approved. And we've got five different locations that we just want to give you some information on and let you know that we're gonna be moving forward with installing speed humps in these five neighborhoods using that, that funding. Uh, we'll be working with engineering services in the coming a month or so to develop a contract to put this out to bid and have a single contractor do all of the locations under under one contract. Uh, here are the streets that have gone through the process and have been, we've collected the data, we've talked with the representatives from the neighborhood, they've submitted their petitions, uh, everything has been validated. It's Arlington Street, Gavin Drive, Jamesford Drive, Kensington Drive, and Wesley Drive. Here they all are on, on a map of the city, an aerial view of the city uh, with the green pin showing the different locations around, around the city. Uh, the first one is Arlington uh, Street, which is connects off of Montlou Avenue down to Camden Avenue. Uh, and is a, a connector street that goes between Gordon Street and Montlou Avenue. So there's a fair amount of traffic that, not a high volume, but there is traffic that goes through Arlington Street, Camden Avenue, Cedro Drive. Uh, and there've been some issues with speeding over in that area. And as a result, the neighbors there file their petition and their requests and their petitions and we we've collected the data and determined that they have met the requirements and the photograph at the at the bottom of the slide here 
shows the approximate location of where we would install one of the speed humps. There are two planned for Arlington Street on either side of Cedro Drive. Cedro Drive is, uh, and uh, Arlington Street are also part of our um, transit network. Uh, and we've determined that these speed humps would not affect transit service uh, based on where their placement would be. The next location would be Gavin Drive. This portion of Gavin Drive is between Meredith Street and Brentwood Street. And we, we have not yet determined the exact locations of where these will be. We try to position the speed humps in locations where they don't interfere with, with driveways and, and such. We haven't exactly determined the, the location of these, but we're working on that. And these are the approximate locations for, for the two on Gavin Drive. Jamesford Drive is a, is a fairly long, wide street up in Jamesford Meadows. It runs between uh, uh, Morris Farm Drive, which connects to Wendover Avenue and all the way over to Guilford College Road. Um, there's, it shows, the map here shows four locations. It's actually really three. The third location is an area where the street is split by a median. So there's one on either side of the median. And the top photograph is where uh, location uh, speed hump number two would be, right, pretty much in the center of that photograph. And then down at the bottom is where um, one of the others would be in the in the short section where there's a median. So there'd be a, a speed hump on either side of the intersection there with Chesterfield. Kensington Drive uh, between Country Club and Lexington Avenue. Uh, there are three proposed there and possibly a fourth. That's the red uh, pin there that may be installed. You are, um, you are all aware, I'm sure, of a uh, fairly significant drain, drainage project that is planned for that area. And we may install, have public services install a fourth speed hump right there where that drainage project is, is uh, planned when that is complete. And the last one is down on Wesley Drive, which runs parallel to a part of the uh, golf course down off Nathan Hunt. Um, this would, would connect Nathan Hunt Drive over to Wise Avenue, and there'd be uh, one in the block of Wesley Drive between Nathan Hunt and I believe it's Worth Street, and the second one between Wise and Worth. Uh, this is a photograph, uh, a rendering that was prepared back several years ago when we put the speed humps in on Rotary Drive. And I use this just to give you an idea of basically what all these speed humps would look like. Uh, in most cases, without the yellow center line, but this is, this is uh, just an example of what they would look like actually out on the street. This is the detail that we use that, that the policy refers to and that we got from the city of Raleigh. Here's an example of a, a typical speed hump in uh, location in Raleigh. And that's, that's pretty much what we are proposing for all of the locations that I've shared with you today. The cost to install these right now is estimated about $5,000 each. So the total is going to be around $65,000 for a total of 13 speed humps. Again, council approval is not required because you've already approved the policy and we are applying that. Uh, all the locations are compliant with that policy. Uh, our budget is set at $50,000. So we're going to have to, to find some addition, possibly find some additional funding to carry this out this year. But I'm confident that we can work with the budget office and find uh, some additional funding within our operating budget to cover that difference. And we will be going out for bid with something later this fall and uh, hopefully we'll begin construction soon thereafter. Can I answer any questions at all about these? I have a question. This is Councilwoman Peters. What What is the biggest expense? Like what, what out of creating one up that's 5,000, what is the, the largest expense of that 5,000? Well, I don't know if I can single out any one thing. Asphalt okay. would be one thing, but uh, the 
for each location, the contractor is going to have to mobilize. And because there are five locations spread out all over the, the city, there's going to be five, they're going to have to mobilize on at five different locations and set up traffic control and things okay. like that. So labor and labor, it's labor going to have to mill out a small portion of the street and then put down the asphalt and roll it out uh, and apply the pavement markings. We would uh, internally provide any signing that we need uh, for that, but it's there's not a lot of material involved. It's it's some labor and some some effort and some okay. uh, and some asphalt, but. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty much it, and that's not that's not too far off target from what it costs uh, cost the city through public services to install the the ones that were put in on Rotary Drive several years ago. So we we're hoping that with that, that estimate is close. Yeah. Mr. McDonald, this is Councilman Jefferson. <clears throat> uh, first, I want to make a comment that I'm thrilled about um, the speed bumps being placed. Uh, I think a lot of us on council, Mayor Wagner can probably attest that um, if we received a hundred calls in a given day, maybe 40 of them would be in regards to, can we get speed bumps on our street? <laughs> so thank you for appeasing at least 40% of our constituency. Um, Arlington, I think is a great spot where it sits in between two schools, Parkview and Montlou. Mm -hmm. Part of the concern I've heard over there is that the speeding that happens on Arlington it's really dangerous for students and families who are walking to both those schools, which both happen to be elementary schools. So they're school aged kids who are young. Um, and certainly I think this increases um, just the safety over there. So that's that's my comment. Um, I have a couple questions. Well, you mentioned that the budget is uh, allocated for 50,000 and that it takes 65,000 to complete the entire project. Um, do you intend to secure the entire funding before getting started or will you get started on the projects and um, with the anticipation that throughout that process, you secure the rest of the money needed? We're going to, we're going to begin with the contract development while we are working on securing the additional funds that we would need to cover that difference to do these five locations. So that would be happening concurrently. And again, I feel, feel pretty confident that within our our department's budget, we can find the additional $15,000 or so to cover that difference. Okay. So the contract development period would take place during the while we're securing while the we're other discussing that with so, so none of the actual speed bumps would be putting in until we have the full 65K, right? Correct. Okay. Do you, um, I guess it'll be bidded out to one contractor. I'm yes. assuming it wouldn't be bidded out to, to multiple. I mean, there would be an opportunity for any number of contractors to respond to the to the uh, request for bids, uh, but yes, it would we would give the contract to one single contractor to do the work. I have an extracurricular question, and I'm actually glad. Um, during yesterday's presentation, uh, Assistant Manager Ahmedo, you mentioned that the the statute for North Carolina includes constructions for buildings but that in our city policy, we include utilities. Did you also mention that we include transportation projects in that as well? So there would be an opportunity potentially for MWBE certified businesses to, to, to bid for it maybe. And I'm sorry, were, were you about to speak to that? Well, I'm what I was gonna say is this would be a good opportunity for a small company. Right. Uh, as Mark indicated that there's a lot of setup moving from different locations. So this would be a good opportunity for a smaller company. In fact, we're doing a great deal of street resurfacing now. And we tried to get the um, company that's doing that to go ahead and just install some of these speed humps. And they didn't want to do it. And they made it known in the price they gave us um, that uh, they, they didn't want to do it. So this would be a good, very good project for a small company that's, um, that's willing to take the extra effort to move from one location to another. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you for that. That's, that's exactly you. right. Well, if there's no other questions, this, we just wanted to bring this to your attention so you'd be aware of it. We've got a number of other locations that we're working on now. Uh, I don't think we'll be able to fund any, any beyond this in this particular fiscal year, but we will develop a, a, another list for another time and we'll work towards those as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, Mr.
Excuse me, Mark. This is Councilman Moore. Yes, sir. The the uh, feedback and what we have learned from Rotary. Um, have we accomplished what what was wanted? And um, you know, did did it do what we wanted? Because I know there have been some complaints about them as well. I, I believe that we have. Uh, we've checked the speeds over there, and speeds are. A, a a little bit lower there. It's not a, dram a dramatic change by any means because rotary is a long street and there's long distances in between those those speed humps. But I believe that they have achieved the, the purpose that they were put in for. We did have some, a very small volume of complaints come through our office at the very beginning. Okay. Uh, we haven't had any any recent issues with with that at all. It's been very well accepted. And I think that the, the folks that live along Rotary have been pleased with them. Good. Uh, what about maintenance? Uh, they've been down a couple of years. Has there been any major problems or maintenance to this point? I'm not aware of any particular maintenance problems. Uh, I'd have to talk with, with uh, the folks in public services to see if they've had any issues. But I think if if they had anything that was significant, they would have brought it to our attention. So I, I don't think there have been any any issues since they were installed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Moore. Mr. Chairman Hudson, any other questions or comments? If not, then we'll close the meeting out with presentation from Sandy Dunbeck on some Opportunity Zone manufacturing. Thank you. I am Sandy Dunbeck, Executive Vice President with High Point Economic Development. And I, along with our staff team, are here today to share with you um, what's been going on with small scale manufacturing and opportunity zones. Um, it was about a year ago that council accepted the small scale manufacturing report and endorsed the efforts of the small scale manufacturing group and um, mayor appointed task force. So what we wanted to do was just share with you what's been going on in the last year. We have continued work during COVID. Um, so I want to turn it over now to some of the members of the team, and we're going to start with Marshall Yandel of Economic Development also. Oh, thanks, Sandy. Um, so I've got a slide up here to kind of show a little, uh, illustrate a little bit about um, what the process has been so far. Um, we applied in uh, 2018 for the small scale manufacturing and place based economic development technical assistance with Smart Growth America. Uh, we were, um, this was kind of used, looked at for a, another tool in the toolbox for economic development in the downtown area uh, and, other, and other locations in the city. Uh, we were awarded this around this time uh, in 2018. Uh, and so this has been a, a multi-departmental effort with our department, uh, community development, planning, the library and the manager's office. Uh, and we've met, um, We've met almost weekly since uh, we started planning for a site visit um, with the consultant. Um, in the original application, um, we, uh, we submitted um, an area uh, which was census tract 143, which is also opportunity zone. Uh, we knew that you know, what would come out of the technical assistance project would benefit all areas of the city, but we had to kind of start somewhere as it was place-based economic development. Uh, this area is a historical uh, industrial area of our town and adjacent to and including some neighborhoods. So that's the eastern, uh, the border would be South Main Street, the southern border would be approximately um, Market Center Drive, and then the railroad to the west and, and north of the property. Um, it didn't take long after the, some of the initial planning meetings with the consultant and Smart Growth America for them to kind of tell us that we needed to kind of narrow this down a bit. And so, um, let me just show you kind of where we went um, from there um, to this uh, area here, which is the Southwest uh, downtown area plan um, that uh, the planning department kind of had in the hopper. Uh, and so we kind of chose this area. It's still got a, a lot of industrial, historical industrial buildings that were underutilized. Uh, it, it still included some neighborhoods and then proximity to neighborhoods, a little bit of the market and close to the, to the catalyst project. Uh, so Smart Growth America worked with a consultant, Alana Proust, uh, from Recast Cities. Um, they conducted that site visit in February. 
leading up to that site visit again, we met with them almost weekly to plan for that. We gave them uh, multiple uh, reports and, and documents from the city that has been done in the past on this area and other uh, efforts by uh, other community groups uh, in the area um, to kind of plan for that event. And so from that um, site visit, again, they interviewed a lot of people and there was a report uh, that was created called the uh, Next Steps Report. And we had a kind of a kickoff event um, in July of last year. Uh, and at that event, uh, the mayor announced the, uh, the mayor appointed a task force of about 15 folks that represent uh, business community, community groups, uh, the, uh, city council members and others. And we had a kickoff event at the String and Spoiler. And as Sandy mentioned, we also uh, had her come back and present uh, to city council uh, and uh, to kind of move forward with uh, some of the recommendations. The task force met in August of last year and then in September, we did a, 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 a kind of a tour of the area to get uh, all the members uh, more acquainted with, with the location. And then we did a work session at, at GTCC to kind of create an action plan. Um, from that work session, uh, there were eight priorities uh, that were laid out. And knowing that we couldn't do all eight at one time, we, uh, we decided to work on, uh, start with four. And so in November, we uh, decided to start with four different um, pro, uh, recommendations, training and programming, uh, Southwest downtown, the Southwest downtown area plan, which I mentioned before, and um, the commercial shared use kitchen and targeted properties. And so uh, the other folks, uh, Heidi Galani, uh, Christina Adams and Sandy will talk about uh, their, uh, each, each uh, breakout team has a staff liaison and, and task force liaisons to it. And they'll talk about those. I'm, I'm the liaison for the training and programming committee. And what that is, is how do we connect the residents that are in this area and adjacent to it uh, to um, the resources that are there, uh, whether that's workforce development resources, uh, training uh, and resources, um, and even hopefully eventually potential job opportunities. So thinking again, place-based economic development, the folks living in, in neighborhoods in that area to the opportunities and, and resources that are, are there. That uh, breakout group is made up of folks from GTCC, the Workforce uh, Development Board, Boys and Girls Club, uh, the Community College Apprenticeship Programs Coordinator, uh, Macedonia Family Resources Center and the Chamber. And so um, part of the things that we just started to plan for was uh, a resource fair at the Southside Rec Center for uh, during National Night Out uh, that was scheduled for August. Um, it's been pushed back to October and we're kind of waiting to see whether or not that will, will happen uh, in October. But the plan was to have uh, different um, resources set up from the, the High Point campus of GTCC. The workforce development was going to bring the, um, the, uh, the bus they have, a mobile unit that they have. Uh, and GAP, uh, folks from GAP would be there to, to talk about that program and others. Uh, so we're kind of waiting to see whether or not that's still going to happen. I hope to hear from somebody today, maybe, or tomorrow to see if that's is still going forward. Um, the other thing we uh, plan to do was company tours. Um, we were going to work with the, the Next Gen program at Workforce Development that was the 16 to 24 year olds uh, and do company tours. Not company tours of all over the city, but but concentrating again on that place-based economic development within maybe a one mile radius of this area of different companies and opportunities that could be available. So we were gonna plan with the 16 and 24 year olds and then also with the Boys and Girl Club, uh, the eighth graders, um, but COVID kind of pushed that back. So the group kind of regrouped and said, what do we, um, what else could we do? And so we are working on now to have a draft of a, uh, a webpage that would hopefully, uh, would have a map on it and connect folks and, and show folks where all these different types of resources are. So if you're needing help with resume or you need help with um, uh, career development, you know, you can click on here and you can see how close it is uh, to, to where, you, where you live or with different programs at GTCC or training programs if you're wanting to be trained in the Furniture Academy or nursing or things like that. Uh, showing um, folks that would look at the page uh, through uh, Google mapping uh, that they are very close, rather close to a lot of the resources that could be available uh, to them. So that's kind of where we're at now and kind of working through that um, process. And hopefully we'll have something uh, to go live in the next few weeks on that. Uh, so um, I will stop talking now and turn it over to uh, Heidi uh, Galani with the planning department to talk about 
the Southwest Downtown Area Plan. Thank you, Marshall. If you can go to that next slide. Um, I am Heidi Galanti, staff liaison to the Southwest Downtown Area Plan. And what you're looking at is a flow chart showing the process for creating the Southwest Downtown Area Plan. This project kicked off in January of this year and uh, with a 26 member staff and citizen committee. Uh, the committee was able to meet three times prior to COVID hitting. And unfortunately, since that time, we, we've been in a holding pattern ever since. Um, we did get to the point of holding a SWOT analysis and creating some themes for the project. And if you could go to the next slide. Um, these, this is just a snapshot of those nine major themes that came out of the SWOT exercise with the group. And they have each have multiple ideas that need to be turned into goals, objectives, and action steps for the plan. Marshall, next slide. Um, so our immediate next steps with the committee when we can get back together will be to create a vision and mission state statement, create goals, objectives um, to address those nine themes, create a project website, and prepare for a public meeting to share those uh, goals, objectives, and action steps. Next slide. So where we are is we are waiting to have a committee meeting for I am hoping that we can get back on track in the fall. Um, I've had a few other projects that have come into play since um, we've, we've had to put this aside and I'm hoping to get those um, put to bed, if you will, shortly and pull this group back together in the fall. So then we can have our initial public meeting to share our draft ideas, then review those, um, more uh, finalize a, a uh, public draft and bring that again to the public for review before bringing it for public hearings before the Planning and Zoning Commission and City Council, which we hope could be sometime next spring. And I'd be happy to answer any questions on that if you have them. Heidi, this is uh, Councilman Holmes. Um, question. I, I uh, and this is kind of to uh, also what Marshall was talking about. Um, the initiatives with Next Gen, how does that dovetail into uh, other workforce development initiatives that are going forward at High Point? Um, so I know that with workforce development and, and the, the Next Gen, we were kind of looking at two different groups um you know we knew that you know we you need to get in early to kind of educate folks on different uh, career opportunities available and so that's kind of why we went with the eighth graders but then the next gen we kind of looked at um ways um to kind of if folks were kind of had graduated and and were you know not quite knowing what they wanted to do but were working at uh, some place and we're looking to level up you know this could be an opportunity for them to kind of um get to know um different opportunities that are available close to them. Um, that's kind of the idea we thought of with the, with the next gen program. Hey, do we have any statistics on that? Uh, how many would be affected um, by the small scale um, initiative with next gen? Do we have any raw numbers or is that still being worked up? It's still relatively early now. I mean, we can we can work on getting some more numbers if you're interested in with the workforce development group and seeing what that how many would that be um, in that area that we're targeting. Um, we can do that. Yeah, that uh, that would be great. Also, um, I know you said 16 to 24. Is that also encompassing uh, pulling in the community college system or higher education? Um, for, for any programs, parallel programs? Yes, the community college is, is on the, the, the task force. Um, uh, Mark Harris, at the, the dean of the High Point campus, as well as Steve Castillo with Continuing Education uh, and Customized Training Program uh, is, is working on that. So uh, yes, they're, they're, we're working on, that's kind of part of it, letting them know also different training opportunities that could be available to them at the High Point campus particularly. Thank you. And a uh, final question. Um, 
also um, how how would gap factor into this? It would it how would how would, would gap factor into it? Factor into the overall overall program for small scale manufacturing, or or is it not at this point? No, it, it's definitely part of it. Um, we had um, before um, Tiffany Jacobs, who's with the community college kind of uh, regional uh, apprenticeship kind of program. She works with uh, um, the other uh, uh, lady there, uh, Wanda, who uh, works to kind of set up apprentices in the, in the triad. And um, so we, we kind of knew that some of the, the things that um, make GAP successful also, um, you know, in, in trying to get more folks that are in that part of uh, High Point uh, informed and um, and aware of the GAP program, we thought to to talk about um, ha and have an information booth uh, set up maybe at the at the National Line Now for Lucky to um, to talk about that more. So that's kind of where we thought with GAP was trying to trying to get a little bit more exposure uh, of GAP to to those uh, neighborhoods and proximity to and around where we're looking at. Thank you, thank you, Marshall. And this is uh, Councilman Peters, just a comment I'd like to make. Um, thank you, Sandy, and thank you, uh, Wesley, for letting us come to this agenda today. Uh, I know that with all this that's going on, we all kind of feel like we're living in silos and, you know, I'm part of the Opportunity Zone Task Force and the Small Scale Manufacturing Task Force. And before COVID, it was just, it was so great to be together and generating ideas and, and, and watching the needle move forward. And, and I just wanted everyone to realize that the task force are still working behind the scenes. And there's still some really wonderful momentum with uh, economic development. And uh, so I just really wanted people to see how hard staff has been working and really generating some really great ideas for our core city. Can't wait till we can start meeting Thank again. I'm, I'm sure Sandy's got some other stuff to tell Absolutely. us. Absolutely. Peters. I think we have uh, another presenter as well. Yeah. Christine, do you want to go ahead and kind of talk about your breakout team? Uh, sorry. Um, good morning, every, everyone. Um, basically, the commercial shared use kitchen, um, prior to COVID-19, we're in discussions with an existing company out of Charlotte, the City Kitch. Um, since COVID-19, um, we've had some issues with uh, communication. In order to not lose momentum as a committee, we decided to just keep moving forward um, with a commercial shared use kitchen in High Point. So we decided that we needed to pick up our momentum and keep it going. Meetings are now being held every two weeks. We've developed a list of potential space and building locations for a commercial shared use kitchen. During COVID, we developed a food business survey and emailed it out to all of the um, food truck businesses. Um, felt like we needed to expand um, who had exposure to the survey, um, that we weren't getting enough data. So we have partnered with uh, several other community um, partners with to post it on their websites like the the farmer's market is going to put the survey, a link to the survey up on their website. Um, Greater High Point Food Alliance is going to put it up on their website. And it's all going to link back to economic development so that we can obtain some data. Um, we know there's a need for commercial shared use kitchen. We just need the data um, to see how much of a need. Um, we have Talisa Ward on board with the committee as well. And she has... Um, basically uh, opened up a shared use kitchen in Winston-Salem, the Enterprise Center. So she has arranged for us as a committee to visit that location uh, tomorrow. And hopefully we can get a better idea of what we need to do moving forward with this project. This is Sandy. I would just say that um, Nina Wilson of Community Development has been leading that effort on shared use kitchen with the able help of Christina from the library. So we appreciate really both of them working on this initiative because we do believe that there is demand and the Winston-Salem has more demand than they are currently able to handle. 
Um, so, you know, this might be a private investor that would come here and develop a shared use kitchen, or there may be some other means um, to help that go forward. Um, this is Jay Wagner. Um, I just have a question. Is uh, there's a shared use kitchen that up in the Asheville area that was developed in conjunction with the North Carolina Department of Agriculture? Have we had any contact with them about the possibility of getting a grant from NCAG and to do one here? We have not that I'm aware of. So, Christina, are you aware of anything with the Department of Ag? Uh, no, ma'am. Um, I will say that several um, several committee members have mentioned grants. Um, as I said, COVID-19 kind of threw us for a loop and, and we're just now picking up momentum. So I, I think that in the last meeting, someone did mention that. I'm not for sure, Patrick Carmen or someone. Um, so that is something that we're going to start exploring. Yeah, I have some connections with, with people um, at the Department of Agriculture. In fact, I received some information and passed it on when Randy Heeman was here. I passed it on to Randy Heeman. I don't, I don't know if that information is still here, but it was a lot of research um, that they did uh, in Asheville when they did that shared use kitchen up there. And I say Asheville, it's in that general vicinity. It may be in Hendersonville or somewhere. I can't remember. But, um, uh, but I did pass that information on. And I think that the Department of Agriculture might be a good place to look for to um, for some assistance on, on getting this done. And if I can help facilitate some connections there, I'll be glad to do that. Perfect. Thank you, Mayor Wagner. So um, the other uh, group that, um, that we have is the Target Properties Group, and I chair that group. So um, along with an ABLE task force uh, that's comprised of Carol Gregg, Tom Van Dessel, Tony Collins, um, along with input from others on the staff committee and the task force. But this was uh, one of the recommendations from the report was to invest in anchor space um, in our small scale manufacturing area. And as we were working on the multi-purpose stadium and a number of things, um, you know, we tried to look at ways that we could meet this goal. Um, and um, we were able through working with property owners in that area to ascertain, and that was when we met Ingrid Volk, uh, the individual she and her husband who has since passed owned about 18 different properties. Um, in the small scale manufacturing area, predominantly along Green Drive. Um, many of them are also in that opportunity zone and involved as part of the Bertano's project. But there were some smaller properties in the area that we thought might be a good way uh, to uh, minimize our investment at this point in time while we had other projects, but give us space that could work for small scale manufacturers. So we were able through community development to secure two properties. And the first of which is 504 Amos Street, which is right at the corner of Amos and Taylor. It's about 1,500 square feet. So it's really a uh, just a, a brick, straightforward building, has a restroom, um, and um, as well as a good sized lot that we might could do additional things and com uh, contribute to community gardens. Um, the other thing, it already has a tenant that's involved in small scale manufacturing and we didn't want them to be displaced as we try to um, have spaces for people in the neighborhood. So Marshall, if you can advance the slide for me, please. The group that's in there, uh, their names are uh, Lee and Margaret Broadway. They do furniture refinishing currently. Um, he takes great care of the property, mows and maintains it, pays for the electric. It does have that additional land for expansion and gardening. So again, they're kind of um, just our, our initial start into having a small scale manufacturer that we really are helping to assist. Um, anyway, it's a great little, little building and piece of property that we can you know, help support people as they grow. Okay, Marshall, next slide, please. This was the second property that we were able to acquire uh, during that process, uh, 713 West Grime Street. 
And um, Heidi Galanti actually brought that one uh, to the group's attention um, as we were looking at the small scale area and at the proposed greenway that the Southwest Renewal Foundation is working on is right beside of that um, proposed greenway. And um, anyway, so we were able to secure this property as well. And you can see on the left, um, the building, and it has a lot of sort of historical significance there. They call it a railhead building is what I've learned. Um, so the former railroad ran right next to it. Um, anyway, but it was overgrown with kudzu and had just an assortment of stored items in there. Anyway, the owner, um, you know, they cleaned everything out of it. And then we were able to clean that kudzu off and get a good look at the property. Um, you can see there's parging is what that kind of stucco like material is. Um, anyway, there are a couple places that the parging will have to be improved, but has a tin roof that basically is still keeping the inside dry. Um, anyway, the, the, the staff group went recently for a tour and some of the comments were, wow, it looks way better inside than I anticipated. <laughs> so anyway, this is about a 3000 square foot building right on Grimes. Um, anyway, so we're excited about the opportunities there and the task force really wanted um, a place in the neighborhood to kind of call their own that they could have as a little bit of a, a place that people could come and learn about small scale manufacturing and really what it is. So um, the thought is that since it's 3000 square feet that we might be able to have a small scale manufacturer in the back section of that and then have sort of storyboards um, in the front um, that would tell the story of small scale manufacturing for High Point and help connect people to assets in the area. Okay, next slide, Marshall. A little bit more of that work that we did around the black. This is part of, and I know council has been working on blight removal. So we really did help to improve this area and the neighborhood just by cleaning out all of the kudzu. We were really trying to get that down and beat back um, before it came out fully um, this spring and summer. And so, you know, it looks in pretty good shape if you drive by now, there's actually grass growing. You can see the backside there um, was cleaned out, but there are some, there's some dumping in behind that that's overgrown in kudzu and just kind of, we're gonna have to make continued efforts and to encourage property owners, but hopefully by modeling that we're interested in the area and, you know, we are working on improvement. Um, next slide, please, Marshall. We, um, one of the things that we wanted to do just to say, hey, we're here in the neighborhood and doing work. We wanted to uh, come up with some type of logo that really talked about the area, um, that we could put something um, to show the small scale efforts. And so this same group did just a little bit and we want to dovetail in, you know, with all the other branding and marketing work that's going on in the city. But we decided that what we really could and should be in charge of is just, you know, these small buildings um, that we could brand them. And so our creative team, really Carol Gregg, Tom, Tony, myself, Ryan um, helped us um, extremely on this project. So so we developed these logos um, that we want to put on signage out front. It might just be temporary signage that we would have there so that people, again, will know that we're in the neighborhood. There's interesting and exciting things going on. Um, those first eight were kind of the first draft of some potential logos. Um, that we came up with. The group got together and provided feedback on what they liked and colors and um, really decided, even though, you know, small scale manufacturing is really becoming known kind of here locally amongst those of us that are working on it, that it really is about people that are making things. And so out of those last four that are um, more maker related, we ultimately chose um, the number one there, High Point Maker. So um, you can see it here in larger scale. So we will have that to utilize on signs or banners there on these little buildings that we own. 
Um, and then when we have uh, tenants that want to advertise as well, you know, we may do some combo thereof. So anyway, I think that's it on those slides. So um, what I wanna do, does anybody have any questions about the small scale? We want to be respectful of your time this morning, and we really appreciated the opportunity to come. So I'll just add quickly, I um, wanted to provide a quick update about the Opportunity Zone work that we're doing. Again, these kind of dovetail together for our downtown Opportunity Zones. Uh, we were pleased with the Britano project, again, by shining a light. Um, on these properties through our op zone and our small scale work, we developed a lot of interest and um, the Britannos have not announced their project yet, but we remain very hopeful um, that that will come to pass for High Point and bring that 65 to $100 million in investment to us. I will say that there are multiple others that are reaching out and are looking at buildings and properties in our opportunity zone. So between um, the value of the buildings um, that we have here, you know, being more affordable, we've been working with clients from um, larger metros that just say, you know, they can't afford to buy space there, but they can afford to buy here. And so they're looking to relocate their company and move here and redo these buildings. So all of this work really adds up to helping us encourage people to invest in High Point and um, create jobs for our citizens, which we think will be so helpful. Some of the things really that we wanna try and address and are trying to do again without um, spending a huge amount of funds is to work on this cleanliness and blight. We've been working with Keep High Point Beautiful um, to talk about ways that we can improve the cleanliness of our neighborhoods and areas um, in the opportunity zone. So um, we're talking about doing some events that might involve um, Keep High Point Beautiful and the task force to do uh, cleanups in the opportunity zone area. And again, just to share really about what we're doing so that it continues to encourage others to invest. That really concludes our presentation, unless any of the other staff members have anything they would like to add. Thank you, Ms. Dunbeck. Ms. Chairman Hudson, again, are there any, any questions for Ms. Dunbeck or anyone from EDC? Oh, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you all, we appreciate it. And there are no other items on our agenda. So are there any further comments, clarifications from anyone? If not, then I will take the silence to assume that there's no objection to adjournment. And summarily, we are adjourned.